Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Tabsu Consulting webinar. Just uh, we're going to review today a few things about COVID and open up the questions. I think one of the uh, most important parts of this presentation will be a Q&A session. Uh, and it'll probably be best for you to use the chat function on Zoom to ask any questions you like. I'll go through a little bit about uh, what we at CAPSIT have been doing and how we've been helping some facilities, what we see as trends in the country, and a little bit of background on what we do in general. So let's get started. So uh, CAPSIT Consulting, uh, was founded based on, uh, to help non-control facilities uh, in infection control and microbial stewardship and all the things associated with that, including um, obviously outbreak uh, issues. So we're experiencing telehealth and we use this to bridge distances. Our goal is to share our experience and expertise so that each and every facility that partners with us achieves, achieves the highest standards in safety, stewardship, and patient outcomes, not uh, just benefiting, not just the facility, but the community at large. So our board certified infectious disease physicians and CIC certified infection preventionist nurses have been working in and with long-term care facilities for over 10 years, in some cases a lot longer than that. We have, despite, uh, despite that, we've, we decided to found Cancer Consulting in 2017 with a mission to support infection prevention and stewardship. What are the goals of what we do are regulatory compliance, helping you with survey readiness, overall quality of care, cost savings, for example, high cost antibiotics, or uh, you know, minimizing use of high cost antibiotics and minimizing complications, uh, minimizing penalties, improved outcomes, and uh, of course, outbreak management, which is what we're going to focus on today. Among the services that we provide, we generally have a week, sorry, have a monthly meeting with all of our facilities to discuss uh, what, what uh, just to stay in touch, to uh, discuss the, the rates of infections, uh, MDRO issues, and everything during that meeting. It's a combined antimicrobial and infection prevention meeting. And having that on a monthly, regular basis helps our staff get to know your staff. We have a, we have a longitudinal relationship with you that really helps uh, in, in the long run. Surveyors love it, uh, but also helps in terms of when there's a problem. We already know your building. We know uh, the people. And we can just jump right in and, and help out. So we're on call for your needs. We can help communication with providers, obviously survey readiness assessments. We can do full building infection control assessments. And we, are, we certainly often do infectious disease sort of mini consultations on cases where providers can call one of our infectious disease physicians uh, and get a little uh, help on treating the patients, especially uh, with uh, now, you know, we've done that with flu a lot. We do that with MDROs all the time. Does this is patient need treatment or not? So that's part of the services that we provide. Just to give you uh, some data in, in terms of what our interventions have been, one of our goals has been to reduce yeah. overall antibiotic use, but also to uh, antibiotic use in, uh, uh, in, in terms of quinolones. So we with our interventions year over year at this one particular facility, we achieved a 17% reduction in quinolone use. And sometimes that's challenging because certain providers don't, uh, don't want to stop their practice of giving levoquin to a lot of patients all the time uh, unnecessarily, but for a lot of reasons, including FDA warnings, you know, surveyors in, in multiple states and, and, uh, are, are coming down hard on, on this. Uh, as, as CMS is requiring it, and uh, states are certainly following, uh, following in mind behind that. So COVID updates new this week. Uh, everyone is masking in most places, and I think any facility, healthcare facility in the country should be masking. CDC had said that uh, all humans should be masking uh, all of the time in public, 
Uh, they recommended that, they're not requiring that, they're going to the grocery store, for example, but, uh, but in our healthcare facilities, we definitely need to be masking all of the time. And that really, uh, I, I, and we, we've implemented that in all of the buildings that we, we support, and we're helping out with extended use of masks. I think that's important. I think we're in for a prolonged pandemic. A lot of data has come out the past few days talking about uh, how uh, COVID might not decrease or diminish during summer. A lot of us, including myself, were hoping that we'd see a major dip in cases in the summer. While we might see some dip, in the summer, that is probably not going to be that substantial. So we're, we're in, unfortunately, in, in for a while. Everybody's talking about antibody testing. These tests are not widely, sorry, are not widely available uh, at this time. We, we hope that they will be. This will really help us cohort staff and optimize use of PPE. It uh, uh, looks like a lot of places on the West Coast so far are flattening the curve. Perhaps that's happening in New York. I'll show you some graphs, uh, but, and, and we hope it's having, happening in, in other parts of the country. But some, some parts of the country are a little bit later in the epidemic, especially the rural areas, and I'll show you some data. Uh, this is data on uh, cases uh, as of uh, March 27th, so there were 86,000. I just want to show you all the progression. You can see that this map is becoming increasingly red, and we have uh, on April 3rd, it was up to more than a million worldwide and more than a quarter million in the U.S., and and now we're almost at half a million, approaching half a million in the U.S. with 1.5 million uh, worldwide. And certainly the U.S. leads the world in terms of number of cases. So this is the uh, daily confirmed uh, new cases. This is looking from, again, from the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID website, which is fascinating. They've got a lot of great data. But this is China in blue. United States is up here. You can see that it seems to be perhaps flattening the curve, coming down a little bit. There's certainly going to be some blips. Some countries like France had a, had a spike here. So, uh, but a lot of these countries seem to be on their way to flattening the curve, which is fantastic news. Just looking at the United States overall again, this is from the University of Washington, COVID19.healthdata.org, and they are reporting on uh, the, the, the peak in the United States, they're expecting it about April 13th. And as you can see that nationwide, we have a bed shortage of 15,000 beds and 9,000 ICU beds and 16,000 ventilators. So that's the projection here on this dot. But notice if, the, if it ends up being worse than the, uh, than the midline of the projection, if it gets worse than this, we're, we're going to have to massively increase these numbers. So overall, the United States is looking at a major shortage of supply. And a lot of that is New York, New Jersey, and on the East Coast, as you've probably heard. The, the shaded gray areas, uh, sorry, the, or purplish areas, represent uh, confidence level of the, of the model. So, uh, and so right now, for New York, they're expecting a peak. That they're expecting that the peak was yesterday and that we're coming off of it. And as you can see, there's a significant shortage of beds, including ICU beds and ventilators. If you look at Texas, for example, uh, this is, their projected peak is April 22nd. So I just picked the date here on April 24th and, and screenshot it. There's no bed shortage, no projection for a bed shortage in Texas overall. But this is rough data. And you have to remember that some states have a lot of, including California and, and some of the bigger states in, in Washington too, there are a lot of beds in uh, rural hospitals that, you know, the, the census, the, the, the licensed bed capacity might be 25. For example, in Texas, every county has, uh, or almost every county has a critical access hospital uh, if they don't have bigger hospitals and they have 25 licensed beds. That doesn't mean they have staff to take care of them and their average census might be two or three. So what does that mean to long-term care? That, that means that you know, whenever we exceed our capacity here, we're gonna look at more cases. And even as, as we're at capacity, we're looking at more cases 
flowing into long-term care uh, facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and that's uh, that is definitely a concern. So this is Washington State. Uh, according to this model, again, this is the University of Washington. Uh, their peak was on April 2nd. So what are they looking like today? Uh, they statewide don't necessarily have a shortage of beds, but again, in the Seattle region, which is the hardest hit, uh, it, things might might be quite tight versus uh, out in Eastern Washington State where things might be uh, might be different. But this doesn't mean that uh, we are out of the woods. They, uh, you know, coming on to just statewide uh, hitting the ICU bed capacity, but that probably means that lots of places will be, you know, over capacity, uh, and there's still a shortage of ventilators. What does California look like? Uh, so California, the expected peak is on April 13th. But look again at the confidence interval. This shaded area, purple area, that that shows that things could be vastly different. We don't expect a statewide shortage of beds. However, certainly in certain in, in certain regions, there is a shortage of beds. So again, remember some hospitals, California has a lot of rural hospitals with extra excess bed capacity. And, uh, but you know, they're opening in California, for example, uh, in Sacramento where the Sacramento Kings play uh, basketball, they're, they're converting that stadium into a, a holding area for non-critically ill COVID patients. So, uh, so things, California's doing, all the states are doing a lot of surge planning. And I think we have to keep that in mind. Again, uh, I think it's not a matter of if we have a case in our buildings, for most of us, it's when we have a case and how do we manage that. So rapid identification and management of ill residents is key. Testing is still problematic in nursing facilities. Lots of counties are prioritizing uh, testing in long-term care. So with some calls to your county uh, officials, we can, we can get testing uh, expedited now that we're in lots of in lots of jurisdictions. Uh, obviously, we're restrict continuing to restrict all non-essential personnel, volunteers, students, visitors, uh, etc. Uh, you know, all communal activities and dining have been canceled and, and and should be extremely curtailed. This is a huge hit for and 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 a controversial thing to do in a long-term care facility, but. Uh, you know, because these people need some social outlets and they will have worse outcomes from a, for a whole host of other reasons if they're stuck in their rooms all the time, as, as you well know. So, so this is something that, that is, is not, this is a recommendation that's certainly not taken lightly. Uh, for those of us who are in facilities where we've already had cases uh, or we're planning for many cases, we're in communication with the counties to prioritize PPE, uh, supplies for us. Uh, all, already sick leave policies have been uh, put in place and we're recommending, you know, screening, of course, all employees prior to start of shift, temperatures, getting uh, high quality infrared thermometers is challenging, uh, but certainly when we have those, uh, screening everybody is, is highly recommended. Ongoing education, training, pushing updates, webinars, uh, trainings, and, and discussions are, are key here. I know that we can't be in meetings all day long, every day. You guys have a lot of, uh, a lot of meetings on that, that you're called to attend already. And we can certainly help with disseminating the guidance that's coming from jurisdictions to the particularities of your facility. That's one of the things that we specialize in. Uh, surge capacity planning, you know, staffing shortages may occur. Sadly, I, I, there's a, a facility in, for example, in Riverside County in California that, you know, where the staff uh, basically didn't show up and uh, they had to evacuate the whole facility. There were multiple cases in that facility. So this, these are things that we're following. We don't want them to happen to us. We, we need to be on top of it. We need to educate the staff. We need to be on, on, in close communication with them. They're very anxious. Uh, a lot of what we can do is help, uh, you know, pass information and, and rational information to calm staff to to keep everybody uh, uh, in line and and working and, and 
I, I spent uh, some time this morning talking about you know, a doctor in a facility that doesn't have any cases, wants to test everybody in the building. Uh, you know, so these are interventions that, that we can do that doesn't make sense necessarily. It's also not practical and we're still facing shortages of testing kits, uh, as well as uh, difficulty in getting uh, the test, uh, test turnaround time uh, quickly. Uh, in, in every, and uh, just a comment on that, whenever there's a, a case in a building, uh, my experience is that everybody wants everybody in the whole building to be tested, including staff. But if there's a case on day one and you test everybody on day two or three, uh, they might be in the incubation period. And if they test negative, it doesn't mean they haven't been infected. It might take six, 10, or 10 days for them to start shedding virus to be detectable on the test. So we're actually not necessarily, and depending on the clinical circumstance, not necessarily recommending that everyone with an exposure gets tested. Every healthcare worker with an exposure gets tested. So uh, we're recommending they mask, continue to work. CDC actually just came up with guidance for non-healthcare facilities in that regard for essential businesses. But we are uh, helping out with with making those um, uh, you know, recommendations. We need we can't furlough 25 staff members who have been exposed. So what are we going to do? Well, we'll have the mask and work and keep track of symptoms and and check their temperatures before they start their shift. Some buildings are actually checking before and after. After isn't certainly as important, but but before is. And hospitals are doing the same. So. You, you're probably all aware of the blanket waivers from uh, CMS on the, the three-day prior hospitalization requirement. So this is uh, interesting and we can help our hospitals do two things. We can take uh, non-COVID patients, really if you don't have any COVID disease in our building, we can help take patients, for example, uh, a patient with a pubic venous fracture who would ordinarily require a three-day stay in the hospital before they can be placed in the skilled nursing facility. Patients unable to walk well. Uh, in that case, with no suspicion of uh, coronavirus disease, they can be transferred perhaps from the emergency department at your referring hospital directly to your facility. In facilities that have COVID cases or a dedicated COVID unit, uh, then we can actually take patients from the COVID unit, uh, you know, that might have mild symptoms of COVID, but are, are too well uh, to uh, to go home. Uh, sorry, are, are too well to be admitted, but not well enough to go home. Maybe those patients can go directly to our buildings. We're also concerned about the financial implications to facilities throughout this, and we want to help keep the censuses up, uh, and so we can help develop policies and procedures that might do that when it's certainly appropriate. So communication with referring hospitals is key, as I've mentioned, communication with public health facilities, counties for PPE supplies, guidance uh, that can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And then uh, we can help at the in individual facility level and as well as corporate level with overall policies, procedures. Um, so our team, uh, I'm the president and, and founder, uh, Dr. Gus Sartell and Christina Hobson uh, uh, work with us and there are infectious disease doctors. And then we have three uh, CIC certified uh, nurses uh, and uh, Billy Marikar and Alicia are the key uh, members of the team and are supporting our buildings. And, and Janine is working on policies and procedures in, in the background now, but uh, at this time, I'd like to open it to questions. So uh, please use your Zoom chat box to ask questions, and uh, we be happy to answer any questions from any participants. One of the things that uh, people have been asking about just I get lots of great questions all of the time and, and no question is too small, but, but they're talking about what do you do with uh, dining you know, you know, services? Are you, do you use paper plates or 
or you use uh, you know disposable utensils the whole time. And the general guidance actually not to not to worry so much about that. Certainly, you want to have procedures on how to get uh, you know deliveries of food and uh, and everything from medication pharmacy into the patient's rooms. But uh, in terms of dining, we don't think that that's a major source of transmission. And um, in a building that might have uh, a, a cordoned off unit taking care of COVID patients and dedicated staff, you might have uh, you know, the dining cart parked on the border where it would be unloaded by staff in the COVID side of the building. And then uh, you know, it would be emptied and then restocked uh, with the people taking care of the COVID patients while they're in their PPE, and then placed in back into the uh, uh, dining cart, and that dining cart can be handled by somebody with simple gloves uh, on the other end without having to be in PPE, and uh, you could conceivably wipe down the, the dining cart uh, if, if, if that was not uh, easy to do, and then you don't really need to take other precautions, even though there might be some contaminated forks and knives, for example, there all those get washed in the dishwasher. Uh, so uh, I, one question here is that a lot of uh, uh, so facilities are getting pressure from hospitals to take patients who have tested positive, who have been fever free for 72 hours, but still have other symptoms. The hospitals don't want to retest. So uh, and we're asking at what point is somebody no longer in, in contagious? And so it's a great question and, a, and something that we're struggling with. The, uh, the guidance is, and the recommendations are that, uh, you know, seven days, so it's a little complicated, but, but a person is considered infectious and needs full PPE for a minimum of seven days from the onset of the infection to three, uh, and then you can add on an extra three days uh, beyond that from the time when they started feeling significantly better. So let's say that they got infected on day one. On day seven, they started feeling significantly better. So on day 10, you can discontinue precautions and they're thought to be significantly less infectious. But when we accept these patients, I think that we should strongly consider putting them in a dedicated unit. And so if somebody, for example, has been tested at seven, uh, been in the hospital for five days, they've been fever free for 72 hours, then the guidance is at, at seven days, uh, they will no longer need any PPE. So uh, we can definitely uh, help you guys out with nuances in your buildings, but those patients might still be shedding a little bit of virus, but it's not considered to be significant. And there, there's no need for further isolation of those patients. So we have to help our, we have to be part of the healthcare system. We are part of the healthcare system. And, and it is scary. But again, having those patients in a dedicated area where uh, if you're getting patients that are, have been having COVID from, the, from your referring hospital, you're likely to start getting COVID in your facility at some point, partly because of your healthcare workers that are going in and out. And you might wanna have a dedicated area where you can have patients who have recovered from COVID and patients who have COVID because the, the ones that have recovered from COVID are very unlikely to redevelop symptoms. So again, feel free to reach out to me offline if you have any nuanced questions about that. So. Uh, the, the next question is type of masks inside facility and out. That's a great question. We, you know, outside of the facilities, uh, in, in public, for example, in grocery stores, CDC is recommending cloth masks. We don't want to take away the uh, paper surgical masks from healthcare facilities. And again, we're talking about extended use and sometimes reuse of those masks in the facility. Uh, one pol policy that's been talked about is have five days, five masks, for, five N95s if you're using N95s, or even surgical masks if you're using those in, uh, per staff member. 
and they, they're stored in a paper bag with the date. And those masks are deposited uh, in in a bag on after after use. After after you know, on day two you use the next mask, on day three you use the next next mask, and on the final uh, back on once you're on the sixth day you go back to the first bag and you use that mask because the virus will have been uh, inactivated in a sense just by sitting in a paper bag for that long. Um, any updates on the availability of blood tests that get results in 15 minutes? So Abbott is shipping the kits, that, that's the Abbott test. That's for the, uh, I don't think that's a blood, uh, that's the rapid diagnostic test. Remember, antibody testing is different than, uh, and that's a blood test, versus uh, testing for the virus itself. So antibody testing can help determine who has already been infected and who is actively uh, uh, versus the uh, direct virus test, which can detect who is actually currently infected. So the tests that we're really focusing on uh, at the moment are the, the test to know if somebody's actually infected. And some of those have a rapid turnaround time in as little as 13 minutes, but on average an hour. And we, uh, you know, we, we don't have a, a lab that can run those tests, but the labs that we contract with, we should be pushing them, and in fact, I am pushing them, uh, some of them to have availability of those tests and the antibody test. So those 15 minute antibody tests, there's only one company as of yesterday morning, that might have changed, I haven't looked today, that has an emergency use on, use emergency use authorization under the CDC, sorry, under the FDA to start testing. So we need that EUA uh, for us to use those tests. And even though they're rapid tests, and some people you can see on the internet, you do it at home test, the current guidance is that you have to have it in a CLIA certified lab. These tests don't have a CLIA waiver and we have to use them in, uh, in a lab. So I'm speaking to a couple of people at different labs to try to get that test available to us because it can help us cohort our staff. There's also an interesting study that Stanford's been doing in the Bay Area on how many people have been exposed uh, to COVID, how many people have antibodies that tested positive. We'll have those results hopefully early next week. Uh, there's one question about the paper go, uh, gown shortage and uh, what do you what do you do? So reusable washable gowns uh, are definitely an option for us. And reusing paper gowns or you know those yellow gowns or the the blue uh, slightly more impermeable gowns uh, is is also a possibility. Uh, one facility had a great idea. Uh, they got lab coats uh, for for people because that's what they they had available to them. And so that's also a great idea. You just want something that covers. Uh, if you have long sleeve patient gowns, those are also an option. Uh, most, most of us don't, but some people are using surgical gowns uh, that are long sleeve. Those are, those are great. Uh, and then what about, uh, uh, so, so yeah, so cloth gowns are, are fine. Uh, PDI wipes are, are running low in light of limited availability. What other sanitizing cleansing strategies would you recommend for BP cuffs, thermometers, glucometers after each patient use? So that's a great question. It, it's difficult. You can certainly home make a, a solution by, uh, for example, a bleach containing solution. You can have your janitorial staff home make you one. You want to make sure that it, it adheres to posted uh, criteria for, for dilution and safety. And you don't want to mix ammonia compounds with bleach, obviously. So, so that's an option of uh, mixing your own. And I, I know of a few people who have been doing that. And then another question, uh, any spe specific criteria to determine whether to admit or not admit patients from acute because not all patients will be tested for COVID. So uh, in, in many states, guidance has been issued where we are not allowed to, as a long-term care facility, we're not allowed to refuse an admission or force COVID testing uh, 
in, in a hospitalized patient. So that puts us in a difficult situation. So uh, a lot of us have, when, are, have been refusing some of these patients. Some of us have been uh, accepting, uh, accepting them when we have dedicated units. And uh, it's really an individualized facility specific decision that has to be made. Uh, if the risk seems really high that they may have COVID and they just didn't get tested, then you can have them tested. But there are some patients who clearly have congestive heart failure, and for example, and they didn't test for COVID even though they came in with a cough and shortness of breath, but they clearly had congestive heart failure. They got better. They don't have any other symptoms. They're, that patient is much less likely to have COVID. Uh, again, you can't rule out COVID and even a patient who comes in with a hip fracture and needs to be transferred to a skilled nursing facility, you know, it's possible that they've been exposed and they've been shedding. Depends on the prevalence in your area. But can you force the, your partner facility to test all of those patients? That's an open question. And uh, the guidance, even with big facilities like, like Kaiser, I was you know, on the, uh, talking to a colleague from, from Kaiser uh, earlier this week, and you know, not everybody has enough testing kits. I, in fact, most people don't even have enough swabs and testing kits. So there is some rationing of testing going on that is not ideal, frankly. We'd love to have you know everybody's COVID status known all of the time, but you know we're not in in that place. We can't know that, so we have to take risk uh, or you know mitigated. Risk. So we have to have a mitigated strategy where uh, where all of this is uh, you know taken into consideration. Uh, another question: reuse of surgical face mask uh, on entering rooms on droplet precautions. Can staff wear the current mask they are wearing throughout the building to go into the droplet room? So ideally, they would have one mask for droplet rooms and one mask that for all other rooms. Uh, that would be the ideal scenario. It depends again on the situation in your building. If you're in a dedicated COVID unit, then you use the same mask for everybody. But if you're in a, uh, if you're not, then ideally you'd have, you know, the dirty mask and the clean mask for each uh, patient. This uh, is in addition to uh, a face shield. And again, if you're using a face shield, that has more protection than just goggles. So face shield will cover your mask. So if that's the case, you might uh, not necessarily need to have a policy to change the mask. Uh, these are nuances and we'll gladly, you know, feel free to reach out to us and, and we'll gladly help. So lots more questions. I wanna keep these uh, webinars on the shorter side. I'll, get, I'll, I'll try, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you're, uh, if, if your questions haven't been answered, I'll, I'll take them offline. My email is up on the screen. We'll do this again next week at the same time. Uh, stay tuned to our website for any updates. We might change the format slightly. And uh, thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you next week.